Previously on Lost Gold of World War II. I found this inside of the tunnel in an area where there was part of a collapse. This was without a doubt an American knife. To the right is the tunnel system for the waterfall. Holy. Wow. And that could mean there's another way into our waterfall. There's something right here. I really want to see what's in the bottom. It's time to get the excavator up here. Casey and Rick Hurt are back in the Philippines with a new team continuing their search for Yamashita's gold. We're going to find a way to get to this treasure. Like many others, John believes Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita took billions of dollars in treasure looted by Japan during World War II and buried it in the Philippines, including somewhere in this mountain. Following a series of mysterious symbols they believe were left by Yamashita, the team is investigating three sites. A waterfall. This waterfall is hiding something. A crater known as Breach 6. I've never seen anything like this. And a camouflage tunnel they uncovered last year. We are in the mountain, boys. Can they finally discover the lost gold of World War II? On a remote mountain in the Philippines, a team of miners led by Rick Hurt continue excavating at Breach 6. Ultimately, we're trying to get to the treasure. Hopefully, this is the access point. A recent nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR scan, revealed Breach 6 is in the middle of a line of underground metal deposits, which the team believes could be treasure left in a tunnel by the Japanese. I've not dug in anything that's looked like this before. After digging through eight feet of soft clay, the miners make an unexpected discovery. From my experience doing a little bit of concrete work, that kind of looks like a small area of concrete. Really could be a concrete cap. Once you find concrete, then you know somebody's been there before you have. Maybe the Japanese were using concrete as protection or an indicator when they were dealing with these treasures. Based on a study of tapes provided by a secret informant, Rick thinks the concrete could be covering a tunnel. The tapes were made in the 1970s and 80s by an American mining expert named Robert Curtis, who worked for Ferdinand Marcos to recover Yamashita's gold. I've been listening to these Bob Curtis tapes. In the shafts Bob Curtis was digging, they also found concrete. They've had uh, gone through the uh, concrete uh, dome of the cavern, broken through into the treasure tunnel, to commencing the removal of the treasure trove. Right now, I'm the most excited I've been. I think we're the closest to finding another way into the mountain. Wow, that stuff's looking soft. It's really, really soft. We hit a spot over there where it was possible concrete. We've jackhammered through that, and we're, we're back into soft material now. Well, Brent, you're out of that concrete. Yeah, it looks like soft clay, fine material. I was hoping for the top of a tunnel. We're about as far as we can go without putting some steel in, man. Yeah, you're getting down there a bit now. We were really hoping when we broke through this concrete it was going to uncover a void space or a tunnel. All we found was more dirt. In order to continue digging safely, the team must build a steel frame to keep the shaft from collapsing. This is their best chance to find what is buried beneath Breach 6. We really don't have an idea of how deep we're going, so we need to get the steel in there, get things shored up good so that uh, we're not going to have a cave-in pin anybody in. Up at the waterfall site, John's been looking for a way to access what he thinks is a treasure chamber 300 feet below. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to figure out a way in. One thing to know where something is doesn't mean you can always get it out. 
The ground below the waterfall is diorite, one of the hardest rocks on Earth. The type of equipment needed to excavate diorite is huge and impossible to haul up the steep mountain terrain. Even if I could bring it in, the whole water supply for the town below comes from our waterfall. We're not going to be screwing with the town's water supply. Days ago, Rick found a possible solution on the Robert Curtis tapes. The right here is the uh, tunnel system for the uh, waterfall. They found a tunnel system connected to the waterfall. And that could mean there's another way into our waterfall. 20 years ago, Rick advised a mysterious Philippine treasure seeker known as Colonel Coriasso, who operated on this mountain. Coriasso always thought the treasure was under the waterfall. Mm -hmm. But he never had us dig there. I mean, he had us down over on the side of the hill, quite a ways over to one side. That's where he wanted to dig. Based on Rick's memory and the tapes, the tech team scanned the area and found a new place to dig. There's some type of metal anomaly in, in this area. I really want to see what's in the bottom here. Determined to find a way into the waterfall, John sends in the second excavator with Rob and Michelle. I didn't think we'd ever get here. I'm excited. After a tough journey through harsh terrain, the team finally reaches their destination. I'm stoked, man. We're like 10 feet away. Keep going until you can. I want to get down to this metal target. Certainly, it could be a tunnel leading possibly right to the waterfall. It's really speculation at this point until we find what we're looking for. Go ahead and rotate till your boom is almost about at that tree next to you. Go. We're here. That's it. That's all we need. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! We Michelle. made it. <laughs> this is a huge gamble right now. We don't know exactly what's down there. I'm hoping that could be an entrance into the tunnel. We're just not sure. While the team goes all in on John's theory, miners Levi and Geo continue exploring the mysterious tunnel the team discovered last year. We got to rip some more timber sets out. So we're just going to keep getting in there farther and farther, maybe into a compartment or something that might hold treasure. Though they believe this tunnel was built by the Japanese during World War II, the discovery of a knife manufactured well after that war has them questioning who else has been here. It's easy to say this knife has been down here for 40 or 50 years, and that puts it 1970s, 1980s, maybe. If it was 70s or 80s, the chances are that there has been treasure hunters in here. Did they find something? Did they beat us to the treasure? In search of answers. Well, those posts were in there pretty good. They make their way deeper into the tunnel. What the heck? Hey, Levi, look at this. What do you got there? Looks like an old plate or something. Looks ceramic, don't it? Not sure. It's porcelain, isn't it? You smell that? <sighs> what is that? I have an idea what this is. So being in the military and being in the mines, we deal with a lot of explosives. A lot of different explosives that you use underground have a distinct smell to them. As soon as I was able to get a whiff of this, I knew it could possibly be nitroglycerin. Well, what's scary about this whole thing, whether it be a Japanese booby trap of some sort or whether it be dynamite that was left inside of this tunnel, the thing about that old dynamite like that, it has nitroglycerin in it. Oh, yeah. That nitro will start sweating, and it is highly, highly volatile. You drop a rock on it, it'll blow up. Created in 1847, Nitroglycerin was widely used in ordnance during World War II. The primary ingredient is glycerol, which is found in animal fats. During the war, the American Fat Salvage Committee rallied housewives to donate their leftover cooking fats to be processed into nitroglycerin. According to the campaign, one pound of fat was enough to create a pound of explosives. Nitroglycerin is highly unstable and susceptible to accidental detonation. 
an obvious risk to anyone excavating the tunnel. You know, this is getting to be a pretty scary business we're in here. Well, that's just it. We have a lot more to worry about than just getting hit with the rocks at this point. Until we know it's safe to go back to work, no one's going in there. At this point, the tunnel is shut down. After finding a suspicious substance in the tunnel, the mining team calls in an explosives expert. Levi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <clears throat> My name's Chad Higginbotham. I am a weapons and explosives expert. I was on this mountain last year and defused some booby traps that we found. Hold, hold, hold. Could have hurt somebody. Give me that. It's the top of a potato masher grenade. Every time that I come back here, I'm always finding something new and exciting about this mountain, like this tunnel that they found. This is the first thing we found. Mm-hmm. And then inside of this was a, a substance, which we don't know what it is. Yeah, it smells a lot like cordite. Invented in 1889 by British chemists, cordite is an explosive made from nitroglycerin and petroleum jelly. It was used in ballistics for rifles and anti-aircraft guns during World War II, and was even part of the detonation system for Little Boy, the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. A lot of these components are 75 to 83 years old. They're degraded, and sometimes it's really hard to defuse them. And I don't know how long you guys have been working in here in that, but. I'd like to take a look, look at the walls and things, because this thing could be booby trapped from the front to back, and y'all have just been lucky so far. Yep. Who's going? Levi and I are going to go in. He's going to show me where they found the device. I'm going to take a look at it, see if it's safe, if I need to back them off. As I start into the tunnel, I'm looking for any other booby traps that may be around, trip wires. To demoralize the Allied forces, the Japanese military regularly deployed explosive booby traps. Roughly 30 tons of World War II explosives are still found annually, including throughout the Philippines. So Chad and Levi must exercise extreme caution as they approach. Going into a tunnel like this with an unknown device, yeah, there's a little pucker factor there. But to me, finding a device is like finding a bicycle on Christmas morning under the tree for a kid. I love this stuff. OK, it's right there on the ground. It's straight across from that bar. Yeah, if you'll step back a little bit, let me take a look at it and see if there's anything else around. Uh, I'm going to dig around it a little bit. If I'm going to remove a mine or anything from this time period, I take my time. I'm very careful with what I do, my movements, how much pressure I put on the side, because it can be very unstable. What are you seeing there, man? I think it could be a Japanese mine. So I got a high-tech piece of equipment here to test for that. Two really sharp sticks. What are you going to do with those? Probe under it and see if I can feel another mine. There could be others in there. Most of the time, they wouldn't just set one. This is like worm fishing. The big thing that's spooky is you get into old explosives. It's not like the explosives we use nowadays that are super stable. Unless you have a really hard concussion, it won't set them off. This kind of stuff here, the most minute bit of impact can set the stuff off. That's the scary thing about the whole situation. Now, there's nothing under it. So you see a detonator or anything? No, the plunger seems to be gone. All right, Levi, if you want to come on up, you can see what I'm looking at here. I'm going to pull the rest of this mine out of here. We're going to take it outside so I can look at it in the, in the daylight. We brought it out, huh? This is what you were finding pieces of. Basically, with the pieces that I have, you can get a pretty good idea of how big this thing was. Mm -hmm. This would be the top, and the plunger would be right here in the center. I think it's Japanese A3 landmine. It's made out of terracotta. 
It's just like the terracotta pavers people use for their walkways and, and their patios and things like that. So why were they using terracotta? They were building ships and tanks and guns and everything else, and they were running out of metal. So they came up with this. As the Allies advanced in the Pacific theater, shipments of steel from mainland Japan were either destroyed by US forces or used to fortify coastal defenses and command posts. Inland soldiers were forced to improvise with other materials, like the terracotta. If this thing would have been live and you'd have reached down and stepped on it, pulled it up or anything, it could have been a really bad day for you guys. The kicker is, can't find it with a metal detector, and you can walk past it two or three times and not realize what it is, especially with the timbers and things that are in there. I'm calling in a K-9 unit to search this tunnel for any other devices. If it's in there, they'll find it. Meanwhile, at Breach 6, Brent and Farrell continue constructing their steel frame. This is hard work, man. We'd better find something at the bottom of this okay. hole. So this is a post. We're going to use this to box in the whole top of this. And that'll keep anybody from falling in the hole. And it'll also keep that up there from coming down on top of us. Once the site is secure, the team can keep digging their way toward the metal deposits. This is the easy part, actually. The digging is the hard part. So the steel's nice, actually. It gives you a little break from digging. Eager to see their progress, Rick stops by. Oh. Not half bad. You uh, ready to go? If this is concrete, I'm hoping that we're real close to something. We don't know what, but we're close to something. You want to tell Rick to pull that up? Yep. We need to get things shored up good so that we're not going to have a cave-in pin anybody in. I am so excited to find out what we've got down there. Another one up. Yo, guys. You guys might want to come look at this. <laughs> what do you got there, Some dude? Dark, dark stuff. What the heck is that? That looks like a burnt piece of wood. Oh, that's charcoal. You can see the wood grain in it and everything else. That is charcoal. It looks like there's a lot of it down here. Look at that. It's a couple inches thick for sure. I wasn't expecting charcoal. I mean, it's a pretty distinct layer. And it runs all the way across. That isn't natural. That's got to be put in there by somebody. Well, we've gotten down below what we thought was concrete, and we've run into a layer of charcoal. It's large pieces of charcoal, and you can actually see the wood grain in them. That's really unusual. Wow, there's a lot of it. That is definitely burnt wood. But it does make me more confident that the hard layer that we ran into a few feet up was probably placed there on purpose. Well, somebody put this here. Somebody put this there for a reason. I don't know what that reason is. But I think we can find out with a little more investigation. After finding a second layer of unusual material in Breach 6, Rick turns to the Robert Curtis tapes to see if they can shed any light on these bizarre discoveries. We need to take another look at these tapes we've got from Bob Curtis. I mean, he talks about the layers and all of this man-made stuff. There were six different levels that uh, had to be reached so that you would know in, in recovering this material Six that you were kind of going directly toward the jackpot chamber. Each site had some variation of these. The maps show the layers. According to Curtis, the Japanese placed specific layers of materials above their buried vaults to mark the pathway to treasure. Today's artifacts include a piece of man-made concrete you can see it there in the mud. About 10 feet below the surface, and was a layer of charcoal. Charcoal at 10 feet. We got charcoal at 10 feet. And remember, charcoal, we see so much of it now, we don't even pick it up. And this is green marble. Marble? This is a painted rock, painted white. 
we found this broken piece of porcelain. We don't have all of the same stuff, but we found what we thought was a concrete layer. And then we found a layer of charcoal about three foot down under that. He had the same stuff. But in many cases in the excavations, there were uh, bones. Now, these bones were generally human. Sometimes uh, they were arm bones, sometimes they were hand bones, sometimes they were skulls. Uh, the actual workmen uh, were actually buried alive with the drove. My gosh. I really don't want to get into digging up bones. I heard about this stuff 20 years ago. It just didn't seem real. And now we're here, and we're digging, and we're finding some of these indicators. We're probably going to see the other ones as well. The next morning, John continues searching for a tunnel entrance into the waterfall. But 30 feet down, Michelle has uncovered nothing but dirt. We should be hitting it pretty quick here, but getting a little nervous. To safely excavate the area, Michelle removes the dirt in a stair-step pattern, reducing the possibility of collapse. I'm ready to uh, go down there and have a, have a look-see. How's the signal? It's pretty loud. It's definitely in there. We're going to have to keep going deeper, which means we're going to keep up to going wider, too. Deeper and wider it is. Now I'm starting to get worried. We should have seen it by now. Oh, she's scratching on something hard down there. Yep. What's happening, Shell? I've run into bedrock. I can't dig any deeper. If we're hitting bedrock already, there's no way we're going to be able to get in this way. Bedrock's not something that I can just get through. I was hoping there's a tunnel down there, but it's not promising. Back at base camp, John gathers the team to discuss other options. I can't drill straight down off the waterfall, and that's because that waterfall feeds a little water supply to the village down below. I don't have many options there. I mean, I have no options. What if we made our own tunnel from the side of a mountain? How far from the site is it to the void space? 930 feet to the target under the waterfall. Wow. It's a, it's a long way. Mm -hmm. 930 feet of digging a tunnel, we would be here forever. I can't see just digging a tunnel 930 feet. There's got to be an easier way. There's lots of borehole cameras that will make it 930 feet to see exactly what we've hit. And once you know it's 100% in there, then digging a 930-foot tunnel makes a whole lot more sense. What about a horizontal drill? They're often used to run pipeline from one side of a mountain to another, and I know they're well capable of drilling over 1,000 feet. A horizontal drill will allow the team to run a borehole camera through 930 feet of hard rock to see directly into the waterfall void. You're still going to have a lot of problems getting through there, but I think it's your best bet. It's, it's the best bet we've got right now. It's the only thing we've got right now. In the US, head researcher Bingo Minerva is searching for Yamashita treasure maps. Since the tapes Rick's been looking through suggest Robert Curtis had access to them. The maps show the layers. Bingo reaches out to a source familiar with Curtis. So right now I'm in Las Vegas on my way to meet Brian Greenspun, who's currently the editor in chief of the Las Vegas Sun, the Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper. Brian Greenspun had a lot of interactions with Robert Curtis. I want to see if he remembers anything specifically, see if he gave him any maps, any details. It would be really great to see one of these maps. Hey, Brian. Hey. Good Bingo. Morning. How are you? Good to finally meet nice you, sir. Nice to see you. Welcome to the Las Vegas Sun. 
my parents started it in 1950. So it's been in my life my, almost my entire lifetime. Yeah. So I guess I'm the, I'm the keeper of the flame, let's say. <laughs> right? that's, that's my story. We've been around a long time, and we've had a lot of headlines. But since you mentioned... Over its 70-year history, the Las Vegas Sun has won numerous journalism awards, including a Pulitzer. Well known for their in-depth reporting, they've covered the search for Yamashita's treasure at length. So the reason I'm here today is that I currently have a team in the Philippines that is treasure hunting for gold. Mm -hmm. We believe we're on a site that is a Yamashita treasure site. We've actually found evidence of Americans being on the property in what we believe is a Japanese tunnel. OK. Now, through my research, I found out that you wrote about Robert Curtis back in the 70s, and, and that spanned for about three decades. So really, the question I have is, how did you meet Robert Curtis? What was it about his story that you know, convinced you to even start writing this? That's a simple question, but it's a very complex answer. So here comes a guy who walks into the office noticeably frightened. He wanted to talk in the car. This was a guy who didn't trust anybody. He felt to me like he was running for his life. And then he starts telling this story about that treasure somewhere, hidden deep somewhere. And so I had to figure out whether it was real. So I spent a lot of time with Bob. Why is he so afraid? Remember, this is 1978. Marcos was at the height of his power. He was in control. President Ferdinand Marcos was reportedly brutal in his obsession to find Yamashita's treasure. After treasure hunter Roger Rojas claimed he found a cache of Yamashita's gold, Marcos allegedly imprisoned Rojas and seized his treasure. Rojas later filed a suit against Marcos to try and recover his stolen goods. Rojas died under suspicious circumstances the night before the trial began. And of course, as it came out, Bob Curtis was afraid because he got out of the Philippines 10 seconds ahead of being killed, and so he thought. And he needed this story told in a most credible way, believing that once a story is out, there's no reason to kill him. Robert Curtis first went to the Philippines to assist in President Ferdinand Marcos's quest to find Yamashita's gold. After several months of working for him, Curtis reportedly learned that Marcos had grown suspicious of him and ordered his assassination. Curtis immediately fled the Philippines and came directly to the Las Vegas Sun to share his story. You have to be skeptical about it. So even then, I mean, really, first impressions with you, you didn't really believe this story. How could you believe yeah. this story? Who was Bob Curtis? He was a mining engineer from northern Nevada. How did he get in the middle of Ferdinand Marcus's hunt for a treasure. But there's no doubt in my mind that Bob Curtis knew that he had gotten himself in the middle of something really huge and very dangerous, that someone could kill him. In a deposition made in 1993 during the Roger Rojas trial, Curtis claims he was recruited by Marcos to process recovered gold, removing identifying marks that could tie it to countries looted by Japan. President Marcos wished to talk to me about uh, the possibility of handling remelting of bars. Eventually, Curtis was given access to Marcos's maps, which supposedly led to Yamashita treasure sites. I was skeptical about his story. And my job was to find out if this guy was real and his story was real. But Bob had tapes and Bob had memos and Bob had maps. Well, we happened to have the ability at the time to get it authenticated, and I did. So you're saying he's brought you actual Yamashita treasure maps? I'm saying I saw maps that he claimed were maps to where the treasures were. And then he showed me pictures deep in these caverns of things that purported to be boxes that he said gold was in. I don't doubt that the maps, whatever the documents, were the conversations that were taped were real. We never would have printed it in our paper if we didn't believe it was true. In his head, printing the story meant that he was no longer vulnerable to being killed because of what he knew, because now everybody knew it. So do you think in his mind, by printing that story, it offered him a bit of a cloud of protection? Yes, himself? oh, absolutely. That's why he came here. He said, let's make it as public as possible. My main reason.
reason for revealing the story at all was uh, the philosophy that if they're going to kill you anyway, take a chance and get the story out and hope that it creates such a stink that he won't dare do it now. Bingo Minerva is meeting with a journalist who investigated Robert Curtis. My main reason for revealing the story at all was uh, the philosophy that if they're going to kill you anyway, take a chance and get the story out and hope that it creates such a stink that he won't dare do it now. So these are the newspapers, the actual newspapers. From Curtis and, and all the information and whoever else we talked to, it's all in these stories. This was our first story. Strongman Marcos hunts $100 billion war treasure. This is the very first story you That's the very first story, place. yes. Everything we learned that we believed was accurate came from Bob Curtis. There's actually something I would like to show you and get your thoughts on. OK. I have uh, these tapes, and this is Bob Curtis's dying declaration. Wow. My name is Robert H. Curtis. If you are listening to this tape, I am dead. This tape will prove beyond anyone's doubt the truth of the story. In either event, this is a dying declaration. So is that Bob Curtis's voice? I've got chills. I mean, I have chills up and down my arms. Yeah, of course that's Bob Curtis. It's the same guy, and it's the same voice. I heard this fear in this man's voice. He was scared. This confirms everything that we believed at the time we first met Bob Curtis, and what we proved to ourselves was true. On January 24th, 2004, the Las Vegas Sun printed an obituary announcing the death of Robert Curtis at 74 years old. His exact cause of death was never publicly revealed. Are you aware of any other leads, any information that'll lead me to any Americans treasure hunting in the Philippines? Well, in our stories, we did, we did write about a fellow by the name of Chuck McDougall. He's one of those experts on this whole Yamashita Gold story. According to Greenspun, Chuck McDougall was close to Curtis and knew his secrets. He could tell you firsthand probably a lot of what Bob Curtis could tell you. Talking to Brian, and the fact that he believed Robert Curtis, I mean, that's further confirmation that there is truth in Robert Curtis's story. So unfortunately, Curtis is not with us anymore. I really need to find somebody still alive that knows more about this story, and hopefully that person's Chuck McDougall. If I can track down Chuck, maybe he has information for us that can help us on our search. Back in the Philippines, a canine unit arrives to investigate the possibility that explosive booby traps are in the tunnel. There he is. Chad just called in Paul. He's a canine handler. His dog's been trained to smell for explosives. We need to get this tunnel cleared and get back to work. We got to get to the end of this tunnel. So is this some type of shepherd, or what kind of dog is this? Belgian Malamar. These dogs are used in special forces, special operations. These are the top dogs of detection of detention of personal protection everything they can pick up drugs and explosives hidden in places you'd never think if there's explosives in this tunnel this dog will find it the best way to explain the sense of smell of a dog is if you walk in a house and somebody's cooking chicken noodle soup you smell chicken noodle soup when a dog walks in the house he smells every ingredient in that chicken noodle soup while dogs were used in combat as early as 600 BC they were not a major part of U.S. military operations until World War II. Over 10,000 dogs were donated to the war effort and specifically trained by American forces to patrol Pacific Theater beaches, detect landmines, and deliver messages. This is what we found so far. Uh, I want to see if he'll hit on it. OK. Uh-oh. Good draw. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Yeah, he can smell it. So if there's more of those inside of the tunnel, he should be able to pick up on those. He'll find it. When he walks in that cave, he's going to search everywhere. And when his nose hits, he's either going to sit like he did here, or he bird dogs and his tails go straight up and he stops. And that'll tell us where it is. OK, well, let's get some gear. We'll head down to the tunnel. All right, you ready? 
Yes, sir. OK. The Japanese, them burying mines in the ground like this, they didn't want them to be found. And they didn't want to hurt you. They wanted to kill you. That's what scared me the most. Here, put that on, Paul. This is a total different element than what we're used to dealing with. Usually, when you go into these old tunnels, you know, we have the potential of getting smashed by rocks, but not something where somebody put a bomb there intentionally trying to wipe you out. This is a whole different world. This here, this is as far as I'm going to go. Don't touch any of that old timber. It's all rotted. Paul, the, the mine was found right here. Uh, so we're going to try to detect from here back. So it's... I hope they're real careful back there. I don't want something to happen and me have to take them out of here. As the sun begins to set, inside the tunnel, Chad and the canine unit sweep for any explosive materials. It's hard saying where the Japanese could put these booby traps. There's so much different material inside of this tunnel. They could put it in the floor. They could put it on top of the timbers. They could put it behind the timbers. Search. Search. What's the one? What's the boy? Is it clear? Not yet. No, sir. No. No. The dog has cleared the area where the terracotta mine was found. All right, Levi, we're going on ahead. Y'all wait here. Search. Well, those guys just went out of sight. I hope the ground's OK back there. We haven't been this far in there. They took the dog in. They're seeing if they can smell any other explosive devices. I told him if it gets too dangerous back there, if it looks too shaky, just to back out and get out of there. We can always bring them back later. I hope they don't find anything, but chances are if they found one, there's probably a chance of them finding another one. I certainly hope they don't, and I personally don't want to get my legs blown off in here. I'd much rather be pulling treasure out of here than somebody who's hurt. While the canine team checks the rest of the tunnel, Rick comes to check on the site. Well, what's the verdict? You got a clean bill of health in there. Oh, that's yeah, that's good news. We cleared it as far as we could. How far did we make it in there? A couple hundred yards past the mine where, that we found. We checked the whole thing out there. The ground started getting shaky. I didn't want them going way, way back in there. But at least we know we're clear up to a certain point. If we have to, we bring somebody back. So now we've got a Japanese landmine in a Japanese tunnel. Something needed to be guarded. What were they trying to protect? I don't think we're going to know until we find where this tunnel goes. Thanks again, man. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. The next morning, Bingo calls to update the team. So guys, I met with Brian Greenspun. He's one of the editors at the Las Vegas Sun. Now, he published a number of articles on Bob Curtis and Yamashita's treasure over the span of about three decades. Bob Curtis, he provided a lot of evidence to the Las Vegas Sun and Brian over there. And unfortunately, they don't have any more of that archival evidence or documents left over. But what Brian did reveal was potentially a huge clue, the name Chuck McDougall. Chuck McDougall, I did some digging on him, and I found out he was actually working with Bob Curtis. I was working with him on a site called Fort Santiago. And I found some archival news footage of him. And I want you guys to check it out and see what you think. I've already sent it to you. OK. The Fort Santiago press conferences became a regular ritual on the evening news. Facts began to emerge, one by one, from the tight-lipped mouth of Charlie McDougall. We think it's gold bullion. We have photographs of maps. We have engineering drawings, other photographic evidence to determine uh, the location, the exact location. Wow, that was pretty interesting. He talked about maps. It makes me wonder if he actually has those maps still. 
You know, if he has those maps still, they maybe maybe has a map of our mountain. Is there any way that we can get to talk to Charles McDougall? Well, I tracked this guy down. He's still alive. He's living in the Bay Area currently. Uh, he's my next meeting. If I can get any information at all, I'll let you guys know. I'm going to see what I can find out. The key that'll lead us to finding this treasure could be just one person. Hopefully, that person is Chuck McDougall. On the next Lost Gold of World War II. This horizontal drill may be our best bet to see inside this mountain. Not looking too good. Hey, Levi. What is that? Is that a tooth? You think it could possibly be a human? I had two original maps of the treasure found in Marcos's office. Do you still have the maps? Yes, I do. Wow. I've never seen anything like this.